America in the 20th century was even more prosperous than it is today. The economy was skyrocketing, engineering projects were world leading, world trade was centered around this expanding country. Business was booming. The American dream was first born in this era. America's borders being so open and accepting of migrants from anywhere, everyone lived a good life in this bright new world. But on October 29th, 1929, Black Tuesday, everything came crashing down. Prices and stocks started to fall dramatically in America. The American stock market, widespread panic ensued. Investors, afraid to buy more stocks, held their stocks. It caused a spiral of economic deflation. This depression echoed around the world. And from 1929 to 1939, most of the world's economies shrunk because of this, this great depression. And this was the catalyst for so many normal people to just snap and switch, becoming ruthless sucks just to survive. One such group was a Philadelphia poison ring. Herman Petrillo and Paul Petrillo both cousins born in Naples, they were hypnotized by the American dream, migrating to the States in 1910. Herman Petrula started clean, he worked at the barber in Philadelphia, but it really didn't take long for him to get greedy and ask for more money. In love with crime and insurance fraud, he started to burn down buildings to get their insurance money. But reality quickly kicked in. He realized he can only do so much arson for it before the police caught up to him and life was over. But one fateful, all the way downtown journey, Herman found his new passion, his new scheme, money laundering. He ran into a group of guys making counterfeit bills and it wasn't the American dream that incaptivated him anymore. It was the art of making fake money look real. Papa Trillo had more of a conscious than his cousin. But like his cousin, he started his life in Philadelphia. He quickly married and opened a tailoring shop on Easy Passyong Avenue. The business prospered. And it was seeming that Paul's life was all perfect. And he can provide a good life for himself and his family. Morris Bulba was born in Russia in 1886. He was always a smart intellectual. He graduated from university at the age of 12 and tutored children straight after. But this intellect, it fueled a dangerous addiction. He became addicted to magical scripture and to crave his itch for these scriptures and this magic, he traveled to China in 1905. He met with a local woman he stayed with her for five years and she tutored him about this addiction that he seeked. In 1911, Bobo moved to New York again to live the American dream. He got married shortly after and opened his own honest grocery business. No one would know that this honest man would soon become the infamous mob doctor. 1929 and the Great Depression hits. And all three of these men were now fighting to survive. In 1931, Bulba packed up with his family and left for Philadelphia to start a new life. And as a side hustle, he put his magical teaching to use as a faith healer. Paul started to work for a life insurance scam company. He targeted dying old men. Cheap policies that weren't regulated. He gambled and put his name on the policy without the victim's families knowing. He earned all of the dead's estates. As for his cousin, well, let's just say that Herman, he kept on doing dirty business. But now, with the help of his cousin, Paul, and his life insurance scam, they didn't have to wait for the victims to die anymore. They just killed them themselves. In 1932, Paul and Bob were met for the first time, initially bonding over magic and spiritual healing. But they soon decided they can benefit each other to get rich quick. 
the Petrilos and Bulver came up with their new game plan. Prey on unhappily married and murderous wives to kill their husbands. The Petrilos handle the life insurance scam side of the business, allowing these wives to put a policy on their husbands' lives. And Bobo, well, he'd give them a quote unquote spiritual way to kill the husband. But really, I mean, a few of these men got bashed in the head and with a sandbag, and some even got pushed off from a high ladder, but mostly it was arsenic and antimony that he used to kill them. So, potions, you know, magic. If you believe that poison is potion. But anyway, what they didn't tell the ignorant wives is that they were writing a big sum of the inheritance towards themselves and the gang to keep. And just like that, in this American dream, business again was booming. The gang grew bigger and started to hire more witches to the scam center. And by 1938, 50 victims were estimated to have been killed by the gang. The strings of wife induced suspicious murders and Paul's connection to the underworld and counterfeit money production, it caught the attention of authorities in 1938. Two undercover agents, Lan Voigt and Phillips, agreed with Herman to kill a man named Alfonso. They used a stolen car in exchange for some counterfeit bills, that was the agreement. Their main goal was to prosecute the brothers for counterfeit money charges. But after two weeks of no contact following the agreement, the agents, they grew weary and they went to inspect and find out if Alfonso was in fact okay. They had focused so much on the money that they completely forgot about the victim that was found dying, later determined to be arsenic in his system. Herman contacted the agents shortly after. He let them know their money was ready. And when they met up, they asked him about Alfonso. Herman replied, don't worry about it, he's been taken care of. But that didn't matter because now with a bag full of $200 worth of counterfeits, Herman was arrested and questioned about Alfonso's death. But under questioning, Herman wouldn't shut up. He snitched on everyone in the operation even to the minute details of every murder. Every single one of them that eventually had to be investigated to prove the rest of the gang guilty. Out of 70 total victims, all but three were murdered using arsenic, the magical doctor potion. He tried to put all the blame on his cousin Paul and Balbor. He said that they were the masterminds of the project. But facing the most feared judge in all of Pennsylvania, nicknamed Hanging Harry, their fate was all but sealed. By March 1939, both cousins were sentenced to death, along with a few of their accomplices. Yet, the mastermind of these spiritual murders, the intellectual doctor turned murderer, the one who used people's superstitions to his own gains. He was only sentenced to life in prison in 1939 and he died there 15 years later.